Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, public money, public code in Europe, and basically try to do a very brief overview of what has happening in terms of public money, public code in the EU institutions. Um, because of time uh, and also because of the topic, I just want to uh, focus on public money, public code, because I know that at the moment there are a lot of um, legislation going on that is worrying a lot of the, a lot of the community, but I'm just going to exclude those. Uh, if you want to talk about those later, uh, we'll be mainly in the booth, or you can just shoot me an email and we can exchange some ideas. So... I always like to start with the basics and always to put everybody on the same page. Maybe this is very familiar for you, but I think it is uh, super important now more than ever to always remember that free software um, guarantees the four freedoms to use, study, share, and improve the software. <coughs> and whenever one of those freedoms is excluded, then we're talking about a non-free software uh, project, uh, however you want to name it. And uh, we are the, first, uh, the Free Software Foundation Europe, so we empower users to control technology, and we do this with free software, and among different activities that we have, we have the Public Money, Public Code campaign. Maybe this is also very familiar for you, uh, and also mainly in this uh, dev room, but just uh, also briefly overview of our campaign. We started this uh, for five years ago, 2017, and we're basically requiring legislation uh, that demands that public procurement or uh, public uh, software uh, that is procured for the, pu for the public sector should be public code. Um, and for this, then, we have uh, different reasons. We use different arguments whenever we are talking with public administrations, with decision makers. Uh, so one of those is definitely is, uh, tax saving uh, because then, you know, the public money should be spent in the most efficient way. Uh, so there is no point to spend public money on proprietary licenses if you can't reuse software. Then the collaboration part is also super important because we all know uh, free software uh, enhances interoperability and collaboration. So administrations can collaborate with each other because it's open, because it's there, and there is no need to reinvent the wheel again. Uh, and then it's also serving the public, because then the public money given by the public, you know, pa the people will know what the money is being spent, and then I think we all agree if the money is spent in a good way, we like that. And of course, uh, to foster innovation, because then we don't have to start from scratch again, but we can just reuse uh, the, the solutions that uh, already exist. So we have uh, in our uh, open letter, we have an open letter that you can sign as individual I mean, organizations, but also public administrations. We have more than 10,000 signatures. And now at the moment, we have seven uh, public administrations. There are some from Germany, from Sweden, uh, from Spain, I think three of them. And then recently, one from Luxembourg uh, has also signed our open letter. So it is not so many, but it is nice to see some administration supporting our um, call or our campaign. But yeah, so now, yeah, that was a very brief overview of uh, the public money, public code campaign. Um, and within this, we have different activities. Uh, and we also actively try to advocate in the EU level in this regard. So today, I want to talk about two EU institutions. I'm going to first start with the European Commission, what has happened in there over the last three, four years. And also I will talk a little bit about the European Parliament, uh, more specifically about the AI uh, resolution, a little bit of the AI, uh, ongoing AI Act. And then I will also talk uh, very briefly about the Declaration of Digital Rights, because these are some of the files or legal documents where we have been active. And yeah. So let's start with the commission. Uh, I think in order to talk about the commission, we have to talk about these two pilot projects, uh, the EU FOSA and the EU FOSA 2. So basically, these were projects that were given to the European Commission by the European Parliament. So basically, the European Parliament told the commission, get 
uh, those uh, pilot projects ready because we need to um, improve uh, the security of the free software tools that, it's, that are, uh, have been or are used on the European institutions. So they did that, they did their best. They, uh, within those, uh, those two pilot projects, they did uh, 15 uh, bunties, three hackathons, to actually you know, audit the code of these um, free software tools within the institutions. However, there, is, there was not budget uh, allocated to these uh, projects, and therefore they could not run any longer. So this was basically, you know, like a, kind of like a, the European Parliament told them how to do it and what to do it, but there was not budget allocated. And I think through the, my talk you will see that this is a, unfortunately this is a pattern. There is a lot of nice wordings and a lot of nice initiatives, but fortunately there is not budget. So they stop doing uh, this uh, project. And in, in 2020, the European Commission released the, the open source strategy. Um, and this strategy is uh, super interesting because this is, as you can read there, it's a communication from the Commission to the Commission. So basically, this is, um, I mean, this is not a legal binding document. So it's basically the Commission telling themselves how they should um, work with open source, what they, you know, should, uh, what they should do. It's like a plan, it's not, not some, again, nothing legally binding. So in this regard, I mean, we still have to say that we acknowledge that the commission has the will, has the initiative to set up these kind of things. And then, you know, they're already realizing that open source is being used in the EU institutions and they need to do something about this. However, as a strategy by itself, it's quite, it's rather weak because it doesn't have any real indicators or anything that we can, you know, you can actually follow up what's happening and see the progress of such plans so far. So if you go to the text, then you can see wording such as like, whatever it makes sense to do so, the commission will share the source code. And again, here it's like when, when, whatever makes sense or whenever it makes sense, what does that even mean? Like it is not clear uh, when the commission should share the source code. And then also in some apart, there is a, part, uh, there is a section that talks about that the commission has uh, the freedom to choose a non-open uh, source tool if there are good reasons to do so. And again, like what it's a good reason, what is not. So all this wording, it's a little bit uh, biased and not biased, like ambiguous, so to say. So it is very unclear. Uh, and therefore, our analysis of this strategy is like, okay, nice, you want to do something, but there is still some, I don't know, we're not quite happy with the wording and the way it was, it was done. However, in 2021, then the European Commission also realized about this, and then they had a decision. So this is a decision, then we saw this transition between a project, a strategy, a communication, to more like a legally binding paper. So in this paper, they want to um, define the conditions under what the, oh, like the open, uh, European Commission is gonna share open source. Mm -hmm. And within this uh, decision, then we can, um, we can see uh, that they are trying now to implement all that is already happening. The uh, European Commission Open Source Program Office. So basically this is kind of like the, the office that will be in charge of taking care of all these plans or all this decision from uh, the past documents I already talked about. So this is, this is a step. I mean, now there is an open source program office that is actually trying to act as a facilitator. So they also uh, do some bug bounties. They also do hackathons. Um, and I, I have to say that they're really trying to do something about, uh, about this. They're trying to implement all these projects and all these plans and all this um, strategy. But again, we, there is not budget allocated to this um, ESIP OSPO. So 
for them it's really hard to you know do what they have to do because there is not human capacity because basically there is no budget so it's really difficult so here we find ourselves again with a very nice you know nice wording you know there is like <laughs> Uh, the, the will and the, and the initiative to do something about this, but no, there is none budget allocated to, to these uh, initiatives. Within this decision, then in the Article 6, uh, a public repository is also included, um, and this is definitely something good. I mean, we have been advocating for public repository uh, for all the open source uh, tools that the European institutions used. And this is, uh, I mean, this is publicly available. Um, so this is, again, another step here. Uh, from here, you, we can see, like, the, not only the European institutions are sharing what they're using, but this is also trying to uh, include the member states. So they're also trying to see, um, you know, to uh, build this interoperable network among member states. So... In terms of public money, public code, this is, uh, this is again a step, and I feel like this is going on, on the right path, but I can, uh, I mean, I cannot really um, say enough that uh, there are some things that need to be worked, work, such as uh, the wording has to be more clear, and again, there, there should be more um, budget allocated to free software in general, and this is not happening at the moment. So... This is basically what happen, like what is happening in the European Commission. I know that at the moment the European Commission is proposing a lot of uh, legislation and initiatives towards open source. They are realizing that open source or free software uh, it's, it needs a, 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 a special regulation. It is important. They, in my point of view, they are noticing that, but. Yeah, within the European Commission, this is what's happening. We can see there is will, there is uh, something. The OSPO is trying to do whatever they can, but no budget at all allocated in this. So now let's talk a little bit about the European Parliament. So as I mentioned very uh, briefly, I want to talk about the, mainly the EU uh, uh, AI resolution. Uh, this was... A resolution that was uh, led by the special committee that was created in the European Parliament to take care of, to do this resolution. And this, this resolution is, again, not legally binding. It's just an opinion, yeah, like a guideline for the ongoing AI Act. And the AI Act is going to be a regulation, so this is going to be legally binding. But the European, Commission, the European Parliament decided to create this committee to exchange views, to talk with experts, to, with stakeholders, and yeah, they come up with this resolution. So, of course, we also tried to advocate there, uh, although we knew it was not legally binding. But again, these are guidelines, and the, the decision makers really, this is a good uh, argument for us. You know, if there are guidelines, we can always bring them to these guidelines because that's why they're using them for, right? Because they need to be used. They always, you always need to go and look back to these guidelines. So in this regard, um, it's hard to, t to say if it was completely successful or not, but there was a huge step. Um, there is a recital that talks about public procurement on AI. Uh, again, we see this pattern from the EU institutions to have this very ambiguous wording of whatever it's appropriate, whenever it makes sense, whatever there are good reasons. And in this recital, we see, again, as you can see, I just quote uh, this uh, recital. So nice, I mean, this is step. And I guess in this regard, we can always use it uh, to benefit the community, but it's still it's super ambiguous. Uh, so this recital was uh, voted, especially like the specific recital, and the good thing is that it found a huge majority within the uh, European Parliament. So that tells something as well, that tells also the will that the European Parliament has, uh, uh, but the downside, as I already mentioned, is it's not legally binding, it's just a guideline, but at least we have something, right? So in this regard, the, then we would say that um, decision makers understood 
the importance of open source on AI. So to br uh, briefly uh, talk a little bit about our uh, FSFE demands for the AI legislation. Uh, we basically, we are, it's very straightforward. We said like AI should be fair, transparent, accessible, and this is only possible if it's open source. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, have an argument on public research and public AI. So whenever there is public money invested on research on AI, then it should be also uh, public AI. Um, at the moment, the AI uh, Act has been still discussed at the European Parliament, so nobody knows how the final text will look like. We don't know if the European Parliament is going to go back and see these guidelines for the uh, AI uh, resolution. It is not clear, but um, I feel like we step in in the moment that we could. Uh, we're still going to try to monitor what's happening there, but uh, so far it's really difficult to see how that's going to develop um, Yeah, from, from now on until, I don't know, I think the last, this is going to be voted by the end of the year in the last plenary. I don't know. Um, and finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about the Declaration of Digital Rights. So this was uh, also um, an initiative, of course, from the Commission. Uh, they just want to have these uh, guidelines I guess, as well uh, to, as a reference point for the digital transformation of Europe. Uh, so we decided to also step in because uh, as well as like with the Berlin Declaration and the Tallinn Declaration, these are always guidelines that we use to talk to decision makers, to public administrations, because they are there. And they talk about public procurement and uh, free software. So we said, like, let's try to also influence the way the wording is going to uh, happen in this declaration. Again, I mean, this is just like, you know, it's a, it's a guideline document for the ongoing legislation. So. A lot of people didn't really like see the point to work on this paper, but I personally I, I saw that it was like the, the baseline to discuss further legislation, so we went for it. And this was super interesting because uh, we also tried to, uh, we approached decision makers and the European Parliament, then they had an opinion as a European Parliament. I win this uh, uh, opinion before going into the inter-institutional negotiations the European position, uh, the European Parliament position was uh, open source or free software was included on AI systems. So there was a nice uh, a article there that was uh, in which op uh, open source was included. However, once the three uh, institutions sit sat down to discuss, then this wording was completely gone. And then at the moment, like the, the final text that was signed by the three institutions removed completely the part on open source, on AI, and then we just have um, a reference to promoting interoperability, open technologies, and standards. That's the final text. It's super unclear. I mean, is it open standards? Is it only standards? It is, for us, it was like, a, it was not the, the ideal outcome because we were quite happy, uh, yeah, quite happy with the, with the opinion from the European Parliament, but then this was completely uh, changed, and that's what usually well, most of the times happens whenever the three institutions sit down to, to discuss. Uh, however, again, I mean, let's look at the bright side as well. We saw that the European Parliament in its position uh, included open source or free software. Um, so, Again, this shows that there is a uh, will or there is, a there is an understanding from uh, the European Parliament as well on this, uh, on the importance of, of open source or free software on AI or on public procurement. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is uh, how this uh, end up, not the best uh, outcome, but yeah, I mean, this is... This is what you get when you try to advocate this uh, European institution sometimes. So just to uh, maybe talk a little bit what's ahead of us, uh, we see, and I think you already got it, we have a very 
ambiguous wording on the documents that we have so far. So we just really trying to advocate for a clear and consistent wording about free software in ongoing um, legislation. So we cannot change what's done already, but we want to, I mean, now that this has been included, uh, we want to make sure that the wording is more clear and also consistent. So again, the European Commission doesn't have to come up with a new wording, with a new inclusion, with something different, but they can just reuse what is already there. And we want to make sure that if we get to this point, then this wording is clear. And of course, that it benefits the free software ecosystem in general. Uh, and then, of course, there is a problem with implementation because, now, yeah, we have a nice wording uh, documents, but uh, there to practice it's a, it's a little bit different. So we want to keep monitoring of like how much of these uh, uh, legally binding documents are being properly implemented. So we basically with this we just have to keep advocating for public money, public code, and then trying to make sure that there is a proper implementation implementation of such uh, documents. And last but not least, I think that's one of the most important one is that we really want to uh, keep demanding that is governmental budget allocated to free software. Because as we can see, there is, there is will, there is some text, but uh, if there is no budget, then that becomes very difficult. So that's, uh, that's what we have ahead of us. It's not quite easy, but at least we have seen what's like the, the transition and uh, the whole process. Uh, we have already pinpointed what uh, we need to focus on. And yeah, we're just going to try to do our best to, to do so. So, and for this, uh, we also need our community. We are, I mean, it is important to talk to decision makers, but it's also important that the free software ecosystem, the free software community also approaches administrations, um, you know, raise awareness of this matter as well. So you can convince your uh, local administration, and for this, if you might be interested, I also invite you to see the talk from my, one of my colleagues uh, in the community dev room. He's going to explain more how you can actually get active on, our, on the framework of our public money, public code, because there is this, uh, sometimes people don't really see the power that just that you guys have to reach out your local administrations and also, you know, like we're not talking about the European Parliament, the European Commission, we're talking about the library of your town, uh, that's also a public administration. So I invite you also, if you are interested, to check that talk. You can sign our open letter, of course, as individuals, organizations, or if also you want to convince your local administration to sign the open letter, well, that's uh, pretty nice. And of course, I, I mean, donations are always welcome. We're a charity and we are really trying uh, to work as much as we can for, uh, to, to come up with legislation that benefits the whole uh, free software community. And of course, spreading the word. I know that uh, this public money, public code campaign is quite well known, but it is, you know, there is always people that don't know or people that don't really know what free software is. So all these things. Um, are super important. We also have a, I mean, we have a brochure on public money, public code, but then we also have a brochure that we have prepared for AI that we use also to reach out to decision makers. It's also on our website. So if you also wanna take a look at this uh, position paper and distribute it, feel free to do so. And yeah, with this, um, uh, just to close up, I don't wanna, uh, I don't want you to leave this room feeling a little bit upset or like, you know, sad. I feel like, personally, I feel quite positive for what's happening at the moment with other uh, files as well. It is just a matter to, you know, we, that's why I really like these uh, spaces and these events where we can uh, talk to each other, we can, you know, discuss, and then we can actually bring all these positions and all these concerns to decision makers because there is a gap between the community and decision makers and we're trying to close that gap or build a bridge so the future legislation that is happening, it's, uh, yeah, it really benefits free software. So yeah, thank you very much and now I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I'll go. <laughs> I, I, uh, 
wonder why I don't hear anything about the changes compared to five years ago. Five years ago, open source did not exist in any enterprise at the European Commission and in any organization. Nowadays, anyone can use mainly or 100%, 90% open source software. And I hear you only complain that it's not free software. The software that is graduated by the CNCF, it is vetted, it is supported by many organizations, uh, there's a rigorous process to get it through and to get a new release. And I, I don't hear anything about what happened, how much of a change we had the last five years. And how much, much, much better the world had is since five years ago. Then we had only Windows and VMware and IBM, and now we have large, large organizations supporting huge amount of code, uh, and I hear you complain. I don't get it. It's a different hey. topic. Yeah, I mean. Can you please repeat the question for the live stream? Well, <laughs> okay, why am I complaining uh, that it's not uh, like free software, uh, although we have seen some changes on inclusion of open source uh, in the EU institutions over the last five years, right? That's uh, basically. Well, it's available. Millions of lines of code. Well, but I mean, it was not available very, like, the open source solutions that have been used in, in the European Commission are not publicly available until they just released this public repository. Before, they were not publicly available. So they were using inner source, they were using open source within the institutions, but that was not open to the public. And that's what we are demanding. CNCF, Kubernetes, Thanos, the whole RIMRAM, all the software is open source. But is it available to the it's public? It's available to anyone in the world. And it's used in the commission. Yeah. yeah. Not about us using They are used in the commission. Yeah, but they it, that was... Yeah, exactly, and that's not available to the public, and that's our demand. I mean, nice that you're using open source, but is it available to us? No, until now. And that's why, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, but I was not really trying to complain at all. I mean, not only complaining, I was also highlighting the will that these EU institutions have, because I can see it as well. I mean, there has been a huge shift and a huge change, and there is will now. Now we have a public repository of the uh, free software used in the public in the EU institutions. That's something. But I'm sorry, this is not good enough yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. One short comment and one short question. Uh, short comment is maybe in the future, like, you can advocate for don't change what you just wrote so <laughs> that they don't remove what we like. Uh, the second thing is when you say that uh, AI must be accessible, what do you, do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I mean, with AI, it's a little bit uh, tricky. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. With that, what, uh, what do we mean with uh, AI being accessible? Uh, I mean, I also have to say I'm not an AI expert here, but uh, I mean, AI needs a lot of uh, data to be trained. Uh, and then if you're using uh, open data, then the results of uh, such research of AI to build uh, something that should be at least available uh, to people. I'm not saying all the AI uh, should be open. I mean, this is another discussion, but if there is public money involved in the research, then it should be open and people should be able to see how these AI systems are being trained are, and what kind of data has been used and, yeah, what not. <sighs> yeah. Sorry? The upcoming CRA, that's not a, one of the biggest threats. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, this is a question uh, regarding the CRA, uh, and that maybe it's a huge threat for the um, free software community. In the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that I wanted to focus on the uh, public money, public code, so basically public procurement on uh, an open source. Um, I would be very happy to chat with you about this uh, because we have also been uh, meeting decision makers on this file as well. And so far, it is still a little bit unclear how we're going to move forward from our side and also from their side. This is just uh, starting, so I cannot really uh, me tell you more. But if for, this, for this topic, I, I would prefer to keep this out, and then I would be very happy to stay with you after, after this talk, and then we can chat a little bit. I think people should be aware of what's going on. 
Yeah, I mean, yesterday, the, yesterday at 11, the, you can see the recordings. There was the European Commission was here, uh, also with Red Hat. They did a panel on this CRA. There was it was super interesting. So I also invite you, if you couldn't attend, to see the recordings of this uh, uh, panel. Um, do you feel like uh, this movement is collaborating with uh, the movement in the scientific field, where if it's a public research, the paper should also be public? Yeah, this is uh, yeah. My time's up. Yeah, I'm going to reply to this. Uh, yeah, so if this is in line with the uh, research community as well. And this is something we have noticed. And we are really trying to uh, focus more now on research because I feel like this is a community that we have left a little bit uh, apart and behind. And with AI, we, know, we notice the importance of including all these research communities. So this is definitely something we want to keep uh, working on and keep, I don't know, try to do it be in a better way because it is definitely a community that can uh, contribute a lot to us. Um, and I think they're quite open to this, uh, to, to be open to be free software and so on. So, yeah, this is on our agenda. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>